NAFTA has been a terrible deal for the United States, one of the worst trade deals in history. Uh, we have some bad deals in this country. Between the Iran deal, NAFTA, Mary, we can look at any deal. We have bad deals. What a stunner. President Donald Trump comparing a trade deal with Canada to the nuclear deal with Iran. Talk about a one-two punch. Already the Iran deal has stirred controversy in Canada with the former Prime Minister Stephen Harper signing a full-page ad in the New York Times praising Trump's controversial move to pull out of that deal, a position clearly at odds with the current Liberal government. And now, just as optimism was descending over the NAFTA deal, the president has once again signaled that he's, well, ready to drop kick the deal over the fence. What does this all mean? Let's bring in the scrum. They like to sort this kind of thing out. Tony McCharles is a reporter with the Toronto Star. Joyce Napier, of course, CTV's Ottawa bureau chief. Craig Oliver is CTV's chief political commentator. Mm -hmm. And our special guest today is the former Conservative leader and current member of the Prime Minister's NAFTA Advisory Council, a Trumpologist maybe, mm. Ronna Ambrose. Great to have everyone here. <laughs> well, Ronna, I don't know. I mean, if you're on that advisory council, <laughs> you've got to be like a Trumpologist. Um, can we just start, though, with the former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's assessment uh, of the deal? He likes Donald Trump's uh, decision to pull out of the deal, but he's gone to the trouble to sign a full-page ad in the New York Times. Uh, Ron Ambrose, is, is that... N typical of a former prime minister and is that his role to do that kind of thing this this is an issue of global importance and he's always had uh, a strong view on this on this deal in particular and on this issue of Iran's threat in the in the Middle East in particular so I think it's perfectly appropriate I think it is too and I also think uh, it is very easy to agree with Harper about his condemnation of the Iranian regime which is in the habit of murdering innocent Canadians in their prisons uh, which they've done a number of times now but where Harper's wrong is to take that and say and so we should get rid of a leash on the Iranians we need that leash we had a leash and I think it's noticeable that it was only an hour or two after the president announced he was pulling the thing down that the Iranians for the first time Iranian troops attacked Israel with rockets because the hardliners are taken over in, in Iran and there's a hard line in Israel as well. Tom, yeah, no, and I think Ron is right. I mean, uh, Stephen Harper was always hawkish yes. on Israel and hawkish on Iran. And, uh, you know, I think that the government took the right tack initially when they came out and said, uh, you know, he has a right to express his opinion. I wish he would express his opinion on issues like this in Canadian newspapers and to, con to, to Canadians rather than going to the New York Times mm -hmm. and expressing right. it there. Um, if he wants to back Trump, come here, tell us why and why the policy of the current government of the day is flawed. However, you know, I think he does have a right to his opinion and I think he's consistent. I do think he has a right to his opinion and I do think he should keep it to himself. Um, and, you know, both uh, the, the Foreign Affairs Minister and the Prime Minister said, well, he's a private citizen now. You do not go ever from being a Prime Minister to just a regular pri private citizen. You are a former Prime Minister. Therefore, your voice carries a lot more weight than a private citizen. The only person in the government who actually said, yes, this is disruptive, is the Defense Minister, who said, no, this doesn't help us. Right. What, right? Is, the, what is the Conservative Party here uh, and the conservative leader's position on this, Harper put them on a spot. Although, uh, last word on this, uh, Ron Amrosty, it's also interesting, uh, under the government that you used to belong to, Canada's embassy in Iran closed, okay? Justin Trudeau said he would think of reopening that embassy. I'm very intrigued now in the wake of rising tension, new sanctions. Does Canada now go ahead and say, we are going to open an embassy in Iran again? And what does that do? Is that provocative to the Trump administration as we're negotiating NAFTA? Well, I, I think we have to ha take our own positions as a sovereign country on this issue. And I happen to agree with Mr. Harper's position to a certain extent because when we look at the Iran deal and we think of the things that it did not include, which for one thing was to make sure they temper their ballistic missile testing or the, the, the building of their ballistic missile program, it also did not include making sure that all of that post-sanctions revenue, economic benefits flowing into Iran actually were supposed to be targeting uh, the rebuilding of the Iranian economy to the benefit of the Iranian people. And that hasn't happened. We've seen massive diversion of money go into propping up people like Assad and Assad's regime and con continued state sponsorship of terrorism across the board. So 
Do I think, you know, Trump's handling of this is the perfect way to do it? No, but I do hope that what comes after this is an examination of how accountable Iran has been and how much better right. we could make a deal like this. So let's hope now Trump engages with Russia, China, Germany, the UK, France, who actually are signatories to this deal, and finds ways to hold them to account. George, because George, even the not, Iranian, Ira even it. Iranian, why scrap the deal and not say this deal is imperfect? We should amend it first off. Secondly, the the nuclear agency of the UN and the American intelligence community told the president that actually the Iranians are abiding by this particular deal. Now we want to extend the deal, make it a better deal, then amend it. You scrap it. You have to start from scratch. Okay, I, I want to move to NAFTA real quick because there's a couple of things, and I'll start with you, Tonda. Um, um, again, Donald Trump uh, saying that, you know, this is such a terrible deal. Uh, there's a kind of a May 17th deadline that Congress has got to sign. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, where are, in your mind now, as we're all trying to read the Trump mm -hmm. tea leaves on this, where are we on NAFTA? I, th I, I, I don't think it's possible to get a deal within the time frame that remains. Right. Um, and I think it's all going to be pushed beyond the next congressional and Mexican elections. Uh, Joyce? Same here. I don't think they can do what they want to do. They're so far apart. We get, you know, little tastes in the morning that, oh, they're getting closer, they're getting closer. Listen, they've got so many issues on the table they're still to settle. Away. Forget about it. Craig. There's no reason Congress has to finish this by the 17th. They're saying that to put the pressure right. on the negotiators. As Ellen Gottlieb, the famous working. negotiator, once said, or ambassador, nothing's over in Washington. The biggest concern now is the end of the, end of the month when uh, the European countries, the NAFTA countries, and China have all been given temporary exemptions. This is the last exemption on the uh, steel, and on aluminum. steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, if they put those in place, all of these countries are ready with their own retaliatory uh, taxes. That's what tariffs are. Uh, and we could be into a global trade war by sometime in June, which would be really, really dangerous. Ronna, you were optimistic last time you were on the program. Where are you now? I think it's all up to Mexico now because this all hinges on the auto part of, the ch of, of NAFTA. And we know this is around the rules of origin related to wages and labor uh, costs and we know that those who work in this industry in Mexico get paid three dollars an hour and those in Canada and the United States get paid a lot more and you know Trump is using wages as a pressure tactic to bring Mexico on board and to of course at the end of this move jobs into the United States and more manufacturing into the United States so really everything hinges on whether Mexico can find a path forward on autos and if they can do that in the next couple of weeks we might be able to get somewhere mm -hmm. um, but if not then this is going to be punted down the road past and, the Mexican and election. Even, if, past, even, if, even past if Mexico comes on side on uh, increasing their wages in the auto sector, then we're still miles away from a deal. There are questions around dispute resolution. There are questions around a sunset clause on the whole deal. There's questions around the dairy and agriculture sectors in Canada. These are huge issues. This is not going to be NAFTA 2.0. It's going to be a new auto pact. Yeah, I, I, got, I got to leave it there because we couldn't solve the NAFTA thing on this one scrum. <laughs> Amazingly, don't worry, we'll be doing it again. Uh, Ron Ambrose, always great to have you on the program. Thanks so much.